good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Royal Economic Society and the Government Economic Service. My name is Anna Valera, I'm chairing today's session. I'm a Senior Policy Fellow at the LSE Centre for Economic Performance and Deputy Director at the Programme on Innovation and Diffusion. It's my pleasure to chair today. This is the second in the Res GS webinar series. Um, there was a webinar on racial equalities held earlier this year. Um, and the third one will be held early in 2022, so please look out for that. Today's topic is spatial inequalities, and we're going to hear from three distinguished experts on the topic. Our speaker, Professor Gilles Duranton, will go first, followed by responses from Grant Fitzner and Philip McCann. I'll do full introductions before each speaker. Clearly, this is a timely and important topic, both internationally and also in the UK, where we're expecting a new white paper on levelling up by the end of the year. Um, just a reminder, we'd really like to invite you to submit questions via the Q&A function. As you think of them during the talks, please just fire them through. We'll be monitoring them and selecting questions to put to the speakers. So our first speaker, Gilles Duranton, is Professor of Real Estate and holds the Dean Chair in Real Estate at Wharton. He joined Wharton in 2012 after holding academic positions both at the University of Toronto and also at the LSC in London. His current work focuses focuses on land use and urban growth in emerging cities, the measurement of urban transportation, and congestion, land development and land use over the long run, technology and real estate and the geography and innovation and technology. He's also an expert in evaluation in terms of place-based policies and infrastructure and regularly works with regional urban um, policy on regional and urban policy issues for national governments and international organizations too. So really looking forward to hearing your perspectives. The floor is yours, Jean. You're muted. Oh, sorry. I, uh, so I was saying it's great to be back to the UK, uh, at least when virtually, hopefully at some point I can come back physically and, uh, and see all friends. So let me share my screen. Okay, looks like this is working. So uh, this is a good opportunity for me to summarize and collect my thoughts on uh, spatial disparities. So. Let me, let me walk through first what I want to do today. I want to do a very, very broad overview of the facts. Uh, my experience is mostly, was first in the UK back in the day, a lot about France, a little bit about Canada where I lived for some years, and a lot about developing countries and, and the US in, in the recent years. Uh, so I knew I wouldn't be able to beat anyone on producing nice maps and everything. Uh, there's quite a lot of that around, so I'll just try to organize the facts. And I think the, one of the issues here is that the facts alone are not enough. We need to be able to make sense of them. So I'm going to try to make sense of them in two different ways. The first one is to propose a narrative about urban and regional change in the last 50 years. Again, apply, we're applying broadly to rich countries, well developed world countries, and providing some beginning of an analytic framework that allows me to bring everything together and allows me also to think a little bit more about policies. So uh, the basic facts, everybody knows, knows some that spatial disparities are large, persistent, and rising. So what does that mean? You know, you look at France, you look at Italy, you look at the UK, you look at Spain, you look at the US, typically earnings in the richer regions are between 1.5 and two times as, uh, as that in poor regions. So we have this very significant well differences in regional well development in regional incomes. Uh, these disparities used to be less persistent uh, they've become more persistent or they've become very persistent well over time, including, including in the US. Maybe the US was a bit later and went to that, but those disparities are today very, very persistent. And, you know, they've remained stable over time, if not, uh, if not increased. Again, that's my reading of the evidence for the US, for the UK, for France. And, you know, if I had more time, I would give you... 
a long development about how actually we should be measuring those things, all the complications about actually where we should be, how we should be will, will delineating regions and all the problems with that and what sort of a measure we should take. Here, we'll let, we'll, we'll, we'll let me just we'll stay there, special well disparities in which countries are large, persistent, and rising. So uh, where does that come from? I think the key fact, and that's the one that policy will have to wrestle with, and this fact is really the central fact about what special disparities to me, they mainly reflect the sorting of skills. So there's a bullet point here, which says, depending on how exactly we do the decomposition, so there will be some disagreement, but between 50 and 90% of special disparities are going to be accounted by the skill, by the skill well composition of the workforce well locally. Uh, this is really, really important. So since this is so important, let me actually repeat it for the second time. Uh, spatial sorting is really, really well central to spatial disparities. And let me repeat it even a third time. This is all about spatial sorting. So what I want to say here is that this is not location, location, location. This is really sorting, sorting, sorting. Uh, slightly more seriously, uh, three points. Well, the reason why I said sorting, sorting, sorting is because there are actually three points I want to make. The first one is that, you know, a lot of those local evolutions, a lot of those adverse local well evolutions actually are going to or are reflecting national trends. You know, we've seen an increase in the college premium in many, many, or in most rich countries. That's going to accentuate any disparity between more and less educated areas. So, the, you know, you, so we have a thing here where they do reflect those national trends. Similarly, you know, we live in a world where a small fraction of earners have actually reaped immense benefits. Those guys tend to live in the same areas. So it means that those areas have seen both an increase in the average earning following the concentration well of those guys in their location and also an increase well locally in the dispersion well of earnings because you have a small minority where even in those areas where they are, they are a bigger minority but still a minority and they've actually gained well gained a huge amount. Then second fact about sorting, there's a lot that we observe uh, when we look at sorting by you know whether or not people have completed some university education, have a high school degree, and so on and so forth. But there's also a lot of the sorting that is actually on unobserved skills. Uh, that seems to reinforce, if not accentuate, those patterns. Uh, so that's so maybe sorting is actually worse than we directly observe in the data. So when we use well panel data, we actually see, see things that at some level will look worse. There's a whole this there's a whole academic well discussion well about this. Of course, it all depends what you mean by observed skills and observed skills that depend on the data well that you have, but still there's something. It's not only about what we observe, it's also a lot about what we don't observe. Uh, then third element about sorting is that this is asymmetric. So the most skilled tend to sort very, very strongly in a small number of locations where those locations tend to do very, very well. Sometimes we call them like superstar cities. So we have this phenomenon where superstar workers are uh, tightly sorted into well, superstar cities. The, the least skilled workers tend to be a little bit everywhere, including actually in the richest area where they tend to be overrepresented. So what you have is that in the Londons and the New Yorks, and the Paris of the world, you have this overrepresentation, this growth of representation of the very top of the skill distribution, but also some overrepresentation of the bottom of the skill distribution, uh, which means that if we care well about poverty, we should also be caring about well, well about well, well about well poverty in those really really rich places. Uh, another thing about the asymmetry well of sorting is that we we tend to see that people benefit more if they are more skilled with them to benefit more from being in those places and vice versa at the other end. I'll come back to that when I talk about agglomeration. Another key issue, another key thing that should be also something that is left front and center for policymakers is the role of area versus industry effects. So if we start thinking about industry effects, and try to decompose with the spatial inequalities. We're looking at what sort of industry where those places are in, how specialized, and so on and so forth. 
what we typically find is that the decomposition leads to a tiny, tiny effect of industries. It's mostly about places, not about industry in places. Uh, when we try to go deeper, like David Carr did recently when in the US, you try to estimate area industry effects. And then what you find is that those area industry effects actually decompose additively and pretty simply into an area effect that's going to be well dominant and industry effects. And with no strong evidence of matches of particular industries or particular types of industries to particular places or particular types of places. So here for policy, I think it cuts both ways because uh, we maybe we don't want to worry too much about industries being located in the wrong place and having policy curb this, but it also cuts well the other way where we maybe we don't need to care too much about industries being pushed to the wrong places. Uh, turning to agglomeration, we in many countries, so here I understand that the UK is a bit different. When you regress some measures of earnings, of income, whatever you want to, or whatever will, will you can use, and you're going to regress that on a measure of local scale, you're going to get an elasticity of 8 to 10 percent. So I understand that in the UK this number may be lower, but because in the UK some of the sorting actually works in the wrong direction where you have large cities uh, with lots of lowly skilled workers. So, but once you account for sorting, everybody is back to those agglomeration and elasticities of two to five percent. Some of it is acquired immediately. Some of it is acquired, well, is acquired well over time through learning well locally. Uh, as I said, higher well agglomeration will benefits for more skilled workers, uh, which means that agglomeration and sorting are going to interact well, to some extent. And also evidence of more skilled workers will generating stronger agglomeration effects. So to try to make sense of those facts, I'm going to tell you a story, which is the story of the US. Uh, so when you look at the data from 50 years ago, the places that uh, were offering the highest wages were Detroit first, and then Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Trenton, Providence. Uh, so all those places today are doing very, very poorly. Uh, but back in the days, they were highly prosperous cities. And the key characteristics of those places, they were all specialized in key manufacturing sectors and vertically integrated. Is that only a US story? The timing may not be exactly the same everywhere, but you know, in the UK, you replace Detroit, Cleveland, and Grand Pittsburgh by whatever, Liverpool, Leeds, Bolton, Grimsby. Uh, if you're French like me, you may want to talk about Nancy, Le Havre, uh, Dunkerque, or Dunkerque. Uh, Le Creusot and so on and so forth. So there's, a, you know, I think we can tell a very similar story in uh, all across countries. So what we've seen is a first wave of shocks starting in the 1950s, 60s, where firms have reorganized themselves, uh, being able to, with workers and managers, being able to travel more, changes in telecommunications, changes in management well practices that made it well possible for firms to actually operate many things from a distance and eventually uh, very very well very widespread we started seeing the separation of production type activities on the one hand and everything else management innovation business services whatever you want to call it well headquarters actually moving when moving elsewhere, when moving to some other cities. So that led to this separation between the, the management slash innovation slash advanced well service places and those that remained with productive activities. So this, so there was a big spatial reorganization, uh, a first spatial unbundling, well, if you want, which was very, very painful, including for places like New York City or London. I mean, both New York, London, Paris were manufacturing powerhouses and they lost all their manufacturing well employment well, today. Well, in New York, it's actually less than 1% that's manufacturing. So up, down from, from close to 40%. So there has been a huge change that was very, very painful well, for those places. But eventually they reorganized themselves around management, innovation. They gained, they expanded uh, 
Uh, those activities probably have strong agglomeration well tendencies, which meant that actually everybody in those activities wanted to come to a small number of well those places. And the others were basically left with production. But with production, maybe the agglomeration effects were less strong. And there was some mobility where in the US, those plants could actually move to those traditional well manufacturing cities and move south to new manufacturing spaces. So adding to this, there was a second wave of shocks uh, that came well a bit later between 1980 and today. Uh, the two main ones were the first is that manufacturing actually by some metrics did incredibly well. It's just that the demand is not following. Like we have only, you know, we have cars, but we're not going to consume three cars each well every year and so on and so forth. Same thing with, with, with washing machines and, and dishwashers and so on and so forth. So it means that we've become really, really good at producing stuff. And because demand is not increasing that fast, it means that actually the amount of employment that's needed to do that is becoming less and less. Uh, and also manufacturing, well, of course, in rich countries got competed away by international trade. Uh, first, well, Japan and Southeast Asia, and then a huge shock welcoming, welcoming one from, welcoming one from China over the last well, 20 plus years. So that left, that left us, so again, this is a story of the US, I'm going to highlight some differences with, with Europe, but that left us in the US with a group of superstar cities, whatever, six to eight of them uh, on both coasts, what, well, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York City, Washington, Boston, and Seattle mainly. Uh, those places have a really sharp focus on business services and innovation. What those guys also did was, in order to prevent an influx of population, they've actually decided to make uh, housing well development really, 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 really difficult, really, really expensive. So that means that actually, instead of having well population well going up, we started seeing property prices well going up and going up tremendously. You know, we live in a world where your median house price in San Jose, well, California is above a million dollars. Uh, of course, that has a big effect and can only accentuate with the sorting, since only well, the richest and most educated can afford to live in these places. Second group of winners in the US, places in the South and in the West. Uh, that's actually a very different model, which is more diversified growth and based on pretty low cost of living and low cost of production. Those places don't seem to be particularly productive, but they let people come in and they actually build well to accommodate as much as people show up. There are some indications that at least in some of those places that model might be running out of steam. You know, uh, house prices in Dallas, Texas over the last five to seven years have more than doubled. Uh, we may be, you know, that may be something that's changing. Uh, Dallas may be moving from being like Atlanta, maybe, maybe more like Boston, maybe more like Seattle. Uh, that's an interesting evolution. Uh, the caveat here is that there may not be such places like this in Europe. You know, in France, we may be thinking about a place like Montpellier, which actually allowed for, well, allowed for, well, for a lot of growth in the last well, 30 years, but this seems to be with the exception rather than this big regional group like in the US. Sec third winning group, which again seems to be more US type, is the emergence of second tier tech cities. So the story here, I think, is that the main tech cities are so restrictive and the tech sector actually is growing and needs to go somewhere. So Silicon Valley at some level is bec has become too small and too expensive. So they've been moving to places first like Austin and so on and so forth. And now we see the emergence of yet another well generation of secondary well tech well cities like Ann Arbor, well Michigan around the University well of Michigan and places like this. Uh, we are not seeing much of that in Europe. Grenoble were in France many years ago. Uh, was perhaps some of that. Oxford and Cambridge seems a bit different when in the UK. So my, my interpretation here is that for the most recent tech wave, uh, Paris, London, Berlin are still big enough well, to accommodate everyone, but maybe at some point they will also be seeking some, uh, some other locations. So in how much time do I have left, Anna? 
Okay, she's not responding. So I, on my clock, I have seven or eight minutes left. So I yes, want to yes, devote. Yes. Okay, I That's want to fine. devote. To, I want to devote all that time to actually do something slightly more formal. So I'm actually trying to make sense of what's happening. This is how slightly more formally I'm thinking about it. So in the short run, we have a labor supply in a place that's essentially, you know, it's essentially vertical, you know, population is not moving very quickly. And there's some downward sloping labor demand. And imagine there's some shock uh, between T and T plus one where the labor demand curve moves to the left, whatever, some reorganization, some activity that dies or whatever. So big leftward will supply of the labor demand curve. So in the very, very short run between T and T plus one, that's creating some unemployment, so big unemployment. So then, you know, we're talking here about Europe many years ago in the US until whatever the late 1980s. Uh, then what's happening between well, over time is, you know, there's no jobs here, so people move. So what you see is the labor supply, the short run labor supply curve moving to the left as people move to other locations. And then you see some adjustment of the wages. And as the wages adjust downwards and some of the labor demand comes back, maybe some new firms, maybe some firms will, will come in from elsewhere. Well, attracted by lower wages, so you see some bounce back of the labor supply of the labor demand curve. And then over time, there's some adjustment that happens where fueled by the adjustment of wages, the labor demand curve shifts back to the right, and then eventually also people move out. And initially, that was actually the main source of adjustment. You go back to a situation where labor is locally scarce again and wages basically go back to where they were. So that's essentially the story of Wolof Blanchard and Katz looking at America between whatever uh, the 1950s, 1960s to the 1980s. And I think some of that was happening in Europe. Maybe those mechanics stops, uh, will stop well before well in Europe, but my understanding is that the 1960s and 1970s in Europe, actually there was a lot of labor mobility. So what we have here is a world where actually in the long run, the labor supply curve is fairly flat, population can adjust, and the labor demand curve actually, as soon as wages start well adjusting down, it's actually going to bounce back. So we have shocks here where over time, yes, this place is doing well, then there's a negative shock, but after 10 years, we are basically back to where we were before with a lower level of population, but otherwise reasonably similar wages and so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, things started changing uh, over time. My interpretation here is that, you know, this is the initial situation I just described, but at some point, if you're being hit by a second shock or third shock, uh, you know, you had the spatial reorganization in the 1980s, and then you're in this product that you're really, really good at producing, but demand is, uh, is not increasing as fast. So you're basically going to shrink, so you're facing more shock. And in that case, one of the key issues is that actually the labor supply curve may not remain flat because those who've moved, or those who were mobile, they've already moved out, and you're left with those who actually are not mobile or are less mobile. And the other really important feature is that I was talking about labor supply and population as being one of the same, but in this situation here, you know, we may want to start thinking about labor supply and population supply as being two different things where, you know, as wages go down, the problem is that, you know, wages go down, but they can only well adjust well done what so much, which means that at some point, you know, people actually start dropping out of the labor force, but they're not moving elsewhere because, you know, as people move out, uh, the cost of living well locally goes really, really low. I remember when I moved to the UK many years ago, uh, you could buy a house in uh, you could buy your house well in Sheffield for a pound. Uh, now you can do that actually in southern Italy, where the, well, there are some places where you can buy a house uh, well for one euro. So it means that in that case, these people are going to stay because of very low cost of living. But at the same time, if wages start well going down, they're going to drop out of the labor force. So it means that we have this wedge that opens between labor supply and population supply. So that, that actually, that limited ability where the wages will to go down will limit also the bounce back of the labor demand curve. So we may end up 
in that sort of situation like here where in the long run, you know, we may have some permanent unemployment or low labor force participation in some places that have been hit by multiple shocks. In the meantime, in the places that do well, you know, the labor demand curve keeps shifting to the right, you know, or there are in all those activities where labor demand keeps increasing, all those new sectors are actually starting in the cities and so on and so forth. But what's happening is that again, here again, the labor supply, because of all those various well to entry, uh, is very, very low well housing well elasticity, uh, the cost of living goes really, really high. So it, so it, so it's putting some, well, some pressure here will eventually, well, on the wages and the wages will go up. So then let me talk about uh, yet another series of shocks. So maybe the more recent shocks, maybe some of it will, in some places were associated with COVID, where what I think is potentially where the problem that makes things even worse is that as you face new shocks, the, well, well, the labor demand curve actually may no longer will bounce back well at all, may instead keep, will keep well moving left. So what's, so what's the story here is that at some point, you know, your local economic activity has been so depleted, you're basically running out of agglomeration effects, you're basically very, very poorly well productive, your wages do not adjust down as much as, as they could or as much as they should, whatever the word should means here. Uh, which means that it, so we make things work. Uh, well, that makes when things work, where uh, labor, where things are really expensive, uh, where the population will really staying put because well, opportunities elsewhere will may not be well that important, and we live well in this world where you know we may be well in this well, well death trap here where as things start being will start with disappearing. They are no longer well competitive well for very much. You know, this is a world that becomes a world of absolute advantage, not comparative advantage. There's no, well, there's no well currency but that can well depreciate. Well, again, well, labor will stay in put and wages do not adjust enough uh, for firms to be willing well, to come back. And we live in a world that may actually be a really, really sad world where actually uh, we're going to face some really, really strong headwinds in terms of policy, because what the tendency will be towards even further decline. So sorry to be to be that negative, but this is um, but this is what I really really fear for many well for many places that are not doing well. So to, so to conclude in my last minute or in my negative one minute, uh, situation of declining cities may unfortunately be worse than it looks. Uh, there's a tendency for people like me to say yes, but we should open up. Uh, those, prosper, well, those prosperous places. So I still think this is part of the answer, but this is an ambiguous part of the answer because that will indeed allow for another slice of population of those places that don't do well, maybe to join in with this prosperity, but that may make those places even worse uh, well at the end of the day. So maybe here we have some, uh, some uh, hard choices well to make. Uh, many places I think have lost their economic raison d'etre, rational, uh, whatever way you want to call that, they need to, they need to reinvent and this is really, really hard. So here at, very, we're at, a, very, very, we're at a very broad level, uh, no one policy is going to fit all. So, you know, uh, we can do infrastructure, I'm somewhat skeptical. Uh, some places can reinvent with themselves as amenity, tourism sort of places. But this will not be. But this will not be with well everyone uh, trying to attract economic activity from elsewhere. That sometimes works, sometimes don't. Uh, one of the key issues is that associated with sorting is a lack of well of local well capabilities where economic activity can restart well from scratch with local entrepreneurs. That doesn't seem to be happening. And the other thing is that we live in a world where many, many cities actually, well, the ones that are doing well, they're sort of growing, maybe not directly, but indirectly by expanding their range and, and expanding with the local well, labor market, which means that in a world with constant population, some places will that do well that are growing, uh, the others will have to shrink, and there may be some really hard, well, 
with some really hardware situations here as well. It's you know it's just an adding up with constraint, but we tend with, but we tend to neglect it, and uh, but it may also have to play a role, especially in a country like the UK, where actually there's been a lot of departures within the last few years with following Brexit. Okay, on those happy notes, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much, Lou. That was so interesting, taking us through the historical perspective, the analytical perspective, and the evidence on policies. Um, our next speaker is Grant Fitzner, who I understand may have technical. Oh, you're here. Great. No, I'm here. Hi. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Hillis. That was a really interesting paper. And can you hear me okay, Anna? Yes, I can hear you. I'd just like to introduce you to the audience. Sure. So, Grant Fitzner is the Chief Economist and Director of Macroeconomic Statistics and Analysis at the UK Office for National Statistics, and he led the organization's COVID-19 response um, in spring summer 2020, where we've all seen what amazing new data we've had at aggregated levels to help inform this crazy time we've been in. So, um, over to you, Grant, on your response. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, apologies for the technical hitches. Uh, we're so secure at the Office for National Statistics, they won't let us use Zoom, um, or at least uh, it's quite a, a battle to get it to work. So uh, I'm here now. That was a really interesting paper, Hillies. And just, just as background, um, in, in a former life, I was chief analyst and, and economist at what was the communities for, Department for Communities uh, Housing Local Government is now Deluxe, I think is, is how it's called for leveling out. Um, we did a lot of spatial economics, a lot of analysis, particularly of, of, of the various public interventions, some of them quite cost, costly, like uh, regeneration programs, etc. And to be honest, we, we did struggle to find some effects at times, despite the billions of taxpayers' funds that have been spent in this area, just highlighting how complex this, this is. Um, just a few observations on, on the paper, and then I'll, I'll try and broaden it out a little bit. Um, Firstly, whether you call it economic geography or spatial economics, it does go back a, a long way, back to David Ricardo, uh, von Thunen's land use model, uh, Delonzo's uh, rent proposals, etc. But it's always been a kind of a quite a niche area of economics, until fairly recently, anyway, uh, where I think it's really exploded. And that's partly advanced, of course, by big data. It's partly been helped by uh, powerful computers that can crunch lots of data and it's really opened up this area in the last 20 plus years in a, in a very interesting way. And of course, those familiar with the UK research would know that there's a number of uh, research centers around the UK that have done some really interesting work on geographical inequalities, spatial economics, et cetera. Um, definitely worth having a look at some of that research, some of which um, when I was in that previous role, we, we sponsored. Um, but if I was to summarize, kind of the, the, the policy perspective on this. Firstly, um, spatial economics, geographical inequality is extremely complicated. Um, it's also very dynamic, um, but at the same time, which might sound like a contradiction, um, there's a great deal of persistence or hysteresis. Um, you think about uh, impacts of say, the closing of the coal fields in Wales, uh, that still persist decades later. And you see a lot of those longer term effects and, and kind of historical echoes lasting for many, many years. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't turn around a declining city, but it does mean, um, as Hill has said, there's, there's no one policy that's all, there's no magic bullet here. Uh, policymakers have to try different things and sometimes they work. More often than not, they don't though. Um, for those of you, on this call who remember the work of Saxonian on Silicon Valley. Once that research was published, cities all around the world tried to replicate the Silicon Valley story. And we ended up seeing dozens, if not hundreds of tech parks built all over the world. Most of which did not succeed in reviving their cities. And, and I wouldn't quite say they were dismal failures, but they certainly were disappointing by and large. Um, and that's because of course, it's not just uh, about building the infrastructure, it's very much around human capital and around culture, um, to which a number of different dimensions come in, areas that are not necessarily the, the forte of economists, such as culture and history, um, and indeed work by people like Richard Florida around the so-called creative class, around amenities, and how do you make a place attractive? Um, it's not just about infrastructure, and it's not just about skills or building a new university campus. 
um, and recreating those kind or trying to create that kind of environment is difficult because actually what you're trying to do is create a complex social and economic ecosystem. Um, and if you don't have the basis for that to begin with, such as skilled workers, then actually attracting them is hard. Um, particularly if you don't have any of the, the major agglomeration benefits of major cities. Um, so I thought, I thought the points around complementarity of skills are really interesting and clearly there is a size effect here where you get uh, larger, you get fatter tails of the distribution of skills, which not only benefits higher skilled workers, but also those lower skilled. I mean, if you're going to be a major G or a barista, you can probably make uh, better money if you're, if you're top of your game uh, in a large city than you can in a smaller one. Um, the amenities point I think is, is often missed, um, but it is important, but I'd also raise one or two others. Um, transport to work areas. If you look at things like the high speed two uh, development in the UK and some of the other areas that have effectively opened up um, the travel to work area and make a wider range of jobs available to more people. Not only is that good for employers in terms of greater choice, uh, but it's also extremely good for, for people with skills uh, in terms of opening up opportunities to them. And I think we may be in the early stages of quite a significant change in employment practice and in labour market opportunities through the pandemic experience where actually a lot of people have realised, as have their employers, that they can actually work for home most of the time, if not uh, full time. And I think the smarter businesses out there and of course, this was a trend that we've seen in IT for five, 10 years at least in terms of virtual global teams. But I think other businesses, other sectors are now realizing that actually they can tap into workforces across the country and potentially globally. Uh, you don't have to be in the office every single day in order to be productive. And I'm thinking particularly uh, in terms of untapped potential, there are a lot of women with professional skills with young children, uh, lawyers and, and other professions who simply because of travel to work and other restrictions such as access to childcare um, are not able to work a full-time job in a major city, but are still potentially on tap to smart employers out there uh, who I'm, I'm sure will find a way of taking advantage of that kind of relatively untapped resource of skilled labor, irrespective of where it is spatially. So I'm not really saying distance and space doesn't matter anymore, but it might matter a little bit less uh, in the competition for, for skilled labour. Um, one or two other points I probably would make though, and this is a particular issue for the UK, but also in the US, if you look at cities like London, San Francisco, et cetera, housing costs have become a major barrier to, to labour mobility. Um, and again, I can't help thinking whether potentially that working from home shift that we've seen because of the pandemic might also start to change that. Now, it's interesting if you look at the data for the UK that London is the only uh, major city now where um, there's been a net outflow of employment. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, a lot of people have decided over the course of the pandemic to move out to places with nicer amenities. Interesting, a lot of them are choosing coastal towns, which historically have been a decline for decades in the UK. Um, and you're seeing a little bit of a re regeneration in some of those uh, coastal towns that are within, I guess, a reasonable travel distance from major cities like London. So not, not something you want to do as a daily commute, but maybe one or two days a week uh, you could manage. Um, and I, so, I, so I guess, you know, the dynamics of this are complex. Not every coastal town is going to benefit from that, but certainly some already are. Um, and likewise, the old market towns, which have been in major decline for many, many years, have been have seen a, a real uh, revival over the last 10 or 15 years because of the development of e-commerce, uh, where you need major logistical warehouses and transport in central locations, which of course is where most market towns were located. Those are also seeing a revival, particularly around transport logistics and warehousing in a way that I don't think anyone would have anticipated 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so I, that's, a bit for, that's a bit more mature than the sort of uh, working from home trend, but it, it just highlights again, the very dynamic nature of cities um, and how you should take anything for granted. Uh, and who knows in five or 10 years, what the next big trend will be. Um, maybe we'll all be working for some giant California based multinational. Um, remotely, of course. But um, 
those are my initial observations. Uh, for those of you on the call who are not that familiar with this literature, it is really interesting and very rich literature to get across. And as I said, alongside the, the excellent work that's been done in the US, there's some really interesting research in the UK, which I'd, I'd recommend to people to have a look at. Thank you very much, Grant. That's right. Okay, our next response is from Professor Philip McCann. He is Professor of Urban and Regional Economics in the University of Sheffield Management School. Um, he's been special advisor to two EU commissioners for regional policy and regularly works with international governments and the UK government. In the UK, he's a member of a large number of expert and advisory groups, and that includes the R&D Place Advisory Group, which I had the pleasure to be a member of with him. Over to you, Philip. Can you hear me okay, Anna? Great, well, well thank you very much. Um, and firstly, thank you to Gilles for um, also kindly sending your slides over in advance, giving us all um, something to kind of shape our thoughts around. And of course, Gilles himself has been someone at the forefront of thinking about how these systems and mechanisms and processes have been develop developing and playing out worldwide, uh, both empirically and analytically. So in terms of my comments, um, I think what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about the specifics of the UK. So there is a large world line, world these issues now. Um, and sometimes fitting that in the context of the UK or trying to understand the UK in the context of the broader literature can be quite a challenge. And now uh, Anna and I have been on various commissions and these things often come up. Um, so there are specific characteristics of the UK in this space, which are important to think about. So the first one, if, if you think about different types of growth profiles, so if you think about interregional divergence versus interregional convergence, around 45% of OECD countries in the last couple of decades have experienced divergent growth, such as the UK. Around 45% have experienced interregional convergence becoming more equal interregionally, and around 10% of OECD countries are more or less stable. There's not been very much change. But those differences also hide a, a much richer set of typologies, if you like, in terms of growth, growth experiences by country. So if you think about growth as being regionally concentrated versus economic growth, which is much more spatially distributed, you can think about growth on those two that kind of axis, those two dimensions. And we can also think about economic growth in terms of whether it's dominated by cities, kind of metropolitan areas, versus a much more diverse range of different types of places. So we've got regionally, versus, regionally concentrated versus diversified, and we've also got kind of metropolitan dominated versus more diverse pattern. And actually across those four typologies, the patterns across the OECD are quite similar. It's around 20% would be regionally concentrated and also primarily metro dominated. So France would sit in that category. If you think about regionally distributed, so in different places, but again, dominated by metro growth, that would be around 25, 26% of countries, that would be the USA. If you think about diverse growth across many different types of places, but regionally concentrated, that's around 23%, that would be where the UK sits. And then thirdly, growth which is regionally distributed and not particularly urban, it's a diverse range of places. That's about a third, that's actually the largest group, that would be Germany, for example. So we have different types of experiences across the OECD. And obviously these things are to do with idiosyncratic characteristics of those countries, whether it's to do with land use planning, infrastructure, education, whatever it might be. There's lots of things potentially in the mix. In the UK, it's one of the things that Gilles mentioned, which is completely correct, is, is we do see worldwide broadly a relationship between the size of the city and the productivity levels and the wages earned by people in those cities. So broadly, bigger cities have higher productivity levels, and there's some evidence that more densely populated cities also, um, but that's obviously conditioned on city size. In the UK, those relationships, as Gilles referred to, sort of break down largely. Particularly if you take London out of the story, if you take London out of the story, the city size, city productivity, city wages relationships in the UK are basically flat. 
So one way of thinking about it is, okay, well, maybe we're mixing apples and oranges. So if you take different types of places, so if you group places according to, say, certain typologies of, of, of geography, where they are, you know, small, small cities close to large cities, or you could think about places which are large towns, but a bit more remote, or you can think about small cities, just not considering the metropolitan areas. You can break down using OECD classifications on all these characteristics. And again, actually, those relationships sort of don't exist. They're very flat. The one element that seems to be a clue is if you look at the actual numbers of jobs in the city center, particularly higher skill jobs, service related jobs, things like that, then that starts to tell you a story. So large cities in the UK, including cities such as Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, actually have very small city centers relative to the size of the population. The number of people working in higher value jobs in the city center is relatively very small. So if you condition on that, then it starts to tell us something. Whereas there are many smaller towns and cities in the UK where actually they've got relatively large numbers of high human capital people working in those city centers. So relative to the size of the city, they've got a big center. So unpacking what's going on in terms of these productivity scale relationships in the UK is, is, rather, dif is rather difficult. At the same time, another aspect of this that many, many people in this, uh, in this discussion will be aware of is a feature known as Zip's Law, which is where you plot the log of the rank of the city versus the log of the population of the city. And this has been something that's been known for well over a century, particularly in the last 60 or 70 years. And what we see again in the UK, the UK more or less converged to Zip's Law in the late 1970s. That was the period at which interregional variations in the UK were more or less at a minimum. Um, but then since then, the UK has increasingly diverged away from Zip's Law. So there's things going on in the UK, which are also to a certain extent idiosyncratic and trying to kind of unpick those is difficult. Another aspect of this that I also completely agree with Gilles, he referred to is this question about structure in terms of the kind of industries in particular places. If we go back to the seventies, for example, there was clearly a structural aspect. To this. There's no question. We see that on many dimensions, but over time as markets have restructured, globalization has, um, has moved forward a pace and so on. Actually, the, the structural explanation differences between places actually have diminished. And there's a lot of work on this. It was originally noted by Bob Rothorn at Cambridge uh, 20 plus years ago. More recently, a lot of work by people like uh, Ron Martin, Cambridge Econometrics and so on. That the structural explanations of differences between places just seem to have faded away almost entirely. So there's things going on within sectors um, in terms of occupations, activities and so on. Another thing I often hear people from government say is when I'm in discussions, ah, yes, but if you go very local, you see these intra-regional inequalities are much bigger. Well, for a start, that's a statistical artifact anyway. As you go down to a more local basis, much more fractal structures in terms of data, then the variations just get bigger and bigger. That's, that's automatic anyway. So there's a, there's a whole literature on this uh, around what's called the modifiable aerial unit problem. You have to measure things on different spatial scales, different hierarchical nested spatial scales, and then look at the variation in these things. And if we do it on those kind of principles, what we see in the UK is approximately interregional and intra-regional spatial differences are fairly similar. The uh, Industrial St Strategy Council, for example, they, they estimated they were about 50-50. Uh, the work of the teams that I work with, it's about 60-40. 60 would be interregional differences, 40 would be intra-regional differences. The point is they're both important, but they also have a slightly different nature to them. And a way of thinking about it, if you think about a country which is internally, uh, let's say in terms of productivity performance, very, very equal across different kinds of regions, like a country like the Netherlands, for example. But by definition, in a situation like that, almost all of the spatial variations are going to be intra-regional. They're going to be very localized because the regions themselves don't differ very much at all. That's true for small countries that, such as the Netherlands or, or New Zealand for that matter, but equally for a very, very large country such as Japan, the inter-regional differences are actually quite, actually very small in the Japanese case. So spatial differences get much bit bigger relatively in more equal countries. That sounds counterintuitive, but we see this observation a lot. The difficulty in the UK is you've got both high intra-regional variations, 
and also very high inter-regional variations and also very high inter-urban variations. We've got huge inequalities across all three dimensions, which makes it particularly challenging. In terms of the adjustment processes around sorting and so on, um, I mean, this is a global phenomenon and, and Gilles and many others have written a great deal on this. I've, I've written some things on these issues as well. But when we look at inter, inter-regional migration in the UK, a remarkable thing is how stable it's been. It's around 1% per annum and it's barely changed in 40 years. And in the 1970s and 1980s, the observation would be, well, people are not really able to move because of the council house type of system that limited migration. But then when the housing markets become deregulated, then these effects get capitalized into wealth effects that have different prices because supply elasticity is very low, as you said. And so people can't move even if they're, they're property owners because the ability to, to get a mortgage and, and go into an area which is double the price, for example. So exactly as you refer to, we've still got these structural impediments to mobility. The, the group themselves who are the most mobile by far are, are graduates. People who've graduated within the first three or four years of university graduates are by far the most mobile group in every country, including the UK. But again, the numbers are still quite small. In graduate migration into London from outside of the London economy in the UK is not much more than about 50,000 a year, which is about two thirds of the employment levels of Heathrow Airport when it's operating fully. And they've, been, they've remained fairly stable. The vast majority of moves are between other regions. They're from the Northwest to the East Midlands, from the West Midlands to Wales and so on. Um, and those patterns have stayed fairly stable. But, but there are differences also in these things which are hidden. And I would refer people to the Social Mobility Commission, particularly the technical appendices at the back of the Social Mobility Commission. What they show is if we try to capture the dynamics of a place on the basis of skills and education. For most places, this works very well. You get you know, pretty high um, R squared values. The problem is, as a place becomes poorer and poorer, the ability to capture wage outcomes as a result of the lower skills profile itself falls dramatically. So for the poorest places, yes, they have the lowest human capital profiles. We know that. But the wage levels that are reflected are not captured by those falling uh, skills profiles. There's other stuff going on as well, um, which I guess is largely the arena of sociologists, political scientists and so on. But that's an important thing because it allows us to tell pretty good stories about many places, but the, often the most difficult places that we want to try to find a way to turn around or help are the ones around that we really know the least about and our standard frameworks in a sense tell us the least about and that's a difficult problem and it's particularly pernicious amongst the lowest social groups the socioeconomic groups so if you think about one of the aspects of agglomeration is agglomeration provides alternative pathways for people to move to develop careers to develop new employment trajectories ed glace was talking about this on the center for cities webinar last week, which I would suggest people to look at it, superb. Exactly this key role of cities historically. What we see in the London case, for example, is the lowest income groups have much higher social mobility upwards in terms of income profiles, in terms of higher education profiles, and most importantly, in terms of life expectancy and quality of life in terms of high quality living um, than people in other parts, in the poorest parts of the UK. So if you compare London with the Northeast, for example, the same income deciles, the groups at the very bottom, life expectancy differences today are five years, which is about the same as the UK difference to North Africa. These are enormous differences. This is, this is out of the Marmot Review 10 years on. So in, in the case of say London and, and other cities, I would guess places like Edinburgh, uh, Bristol, cities in some sense are playing that role. They are providing those pathways for people to move onwards and upwards, but it would be hard to claim that, that would be true for many of the large cities in the UK. The reason is many of the large cities outside of the south of England underperform dramatically, not just relative to their size, they're not even punching at their own weight, they're, they're underpunching. So these are these are really my observations in terms of specifics of the UK. The, there are many peculiarities of the UK as there are with every every country, but particularly in this this kind of urban regional context, it's it's particularly challenging. So I'll, I'll stop there, Anna, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Philip. So we've had a few questions in the Q&A and we've got um, a while, 15 minutes. 
do 60 minutes to cover them. Um, one that I think has come up a lot, and also it was a question I had in my mind, um, that there's, you know, there's obviously a lot of discussion in terms of to what extent is COVID going to change the nature of imbalances because of changing work patterns, the reach of cities being different. Um, is, I mean, there have been questions, in, including from Josiah Little-Hales, if, if travel costs fall, is there more hope for regional cities? But I think the challenge here is, um, in a sense, this is a current change, and yet we want to have policies to try and address regional disparities while this change perhaps is cementing itself or continuing to evolve. And then linked in with other changes as well. So net zero, for example, or decarbonisation, a lot of the action in terms of investments and associated innovation spillovers that can emerge in areas with high investment intensity in particular areas, that's probably not something that's necessarily going to really benefit those urban centres which previously benefited from the management and, and those kind of centralised um, kinds of activities. So I wonder if the speakers could kind of give their view on what's the best way of taking the experience to date forwards in this decade where we're seeing a lot of change and some of it quite radical change for some places. Gilles, would you like to start? Oh, you want me to start on the, on the easiest question. Uh, so I think Grant already somewhat said it. I mean, my thinking on COVID is uh, this is a reduction in commuting costs in the sense that instead of commuting five days a week, you're going to commute less. Uh, one, key, one key question here is actually how much less uh, Nick Bloom is saying 40% less. Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It may be, may be less than that. Lots of employers, including mine, actually are pushing for people to go back and be, and be part of it as opposed to just be on Zoom at home. Uh, so, but it's, so it's, it's, if we think about that as being lower commuting costs, and actually in the, in the US, there's lots of evidence, for instance, of flattening of the well of the, land, well of the run gradients and stuff. So I think this is happening for real. At the same time, it's not like completely free location because you still need to go to work from time to time. So you're still attached to your workplace, to a particular city. Uh, in a world where there would be more flexible housing, we would see perhaps bigger reloc reallocations. In the UK, it's likely to happen through the prices, even in the long run. And I think indeed, uh, some locations further away, some towns further away are likely to become suburbs, uh, typically suburbs of London, maybe suburbs of other places. Uh, we, I mean, my bet is that we're going to see this, will this phenomenon will going on. Uh, how strongly, I just don't know. It, it may be pretty significant, but again, uh, I think a lot of firms are still in wait and see about how to manage with their workforce. Uh, time in the workplace versus time outside and stuff. I think, you know, I have a wife who's now working at home with two days a week, uh, but I think, you know, between teaching and meetings and stuff, uh, I've been at the office uh, most of the time. I'm still home today, but I'll be going to do my office hours in person this afternoon. Uh, so again, I think this is a big unknown here. Uh, we've, we're moving from a world where essentially remote work was 5%. To more, but is that going to be 20%? Is that going to be 40%? Is that going to be even more or even less? I just don't know. Uh, electrification transition. I think it's a really hard question and I don't have any clear ideas here. It's, I'm not quite sure where those economic activities most impacted are going to be. I have a feeling that some of that is going to be yet more negativity for places that are really struggling because they actually are big emitters through the sort of activity that they have. And uh, we also know, I think from the data that carbon emissions tend to go down with city population, with population density, uh, at least in the US, I don't know elsewhere, but that seems something plausible, you know, when we live in more compact environments, we're not driving that much less. This is something I've explored with Matt Turner, but uh, you know, we occupy smaller housing, multifamily housing, which, uh, which is far more effective in terms of heating and air conditioning and so on and so forth. Great. Um, Philip or Grant, do you have kind of UK perspective in terms of the balance of these different transitions that we're facing in this next 
um, you know, whether there are challenges for specific areas or also perhaps new opportunities that might differentiate this way change to the past. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably just add an observation on homeworking. Um, one of the things that's interesting, and we, we have published an article earlier in the year, and we will be doing more analysis of this soon on, on homeworking, is when you ask businesses between one quarter and one fifth of them say that they're planning to use hybrid working or, and more home-based working as a permanent part of their new business model. So that's just a minority, but still quite a significant proportion of the workforce. When you ask employer, uh, when you ask individuals who've been home working, which uh, is a large proportion of the UK workforce over the course of the last 80 months, 85% said they'd like to keep hybrid working. So there's a real disconnect between what employees want and what employers want. Now, ordinarily, you would expect businesses preference to prevail, but we are in a position where there is unprecedented levels of worker shortage and labour demand in the UK economy. Job vacancies are at their highest level ever. And employees have a lot of choice as to whether they want to stay with their existing employer or move somewhere else and maybe move to an employer who is a bit more amenable to that hybrid model. Um, and indeed, we're also seeing a significant increase in um, people leaving their employment for other jobs. So there's a lot of churn at the moment. And, and, and it's fair to say that employees are probably in a stronger position than they have been for a long time in terms of changing employers, changing occupations. And moving to something else, so I, it's 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 too early to see how how that will pan out. But I suspect that um, if employees do vote with their feet and opt to work for employers that are offering a more flexible approach, then we will see hybrid working embedded as a permanent feature of many business models in the UK. And I would expect that, that would be similar in other OECD countries as well, or maybe not to quite the same extent uh, on continental Europe. And you know, I could, I could speculate about what the impacts of that will be on work-life balance, on productivity, on closing the gender pay gap, et cetera, but it's, it's really too early to know how those will play out, but certainly are potentially really interesting structural change that will have a big impact on cities as well. Thank you. Philip, do you have a quick thought on that before we go into another question? Uh, just very quickly, I, I, I do, um, I think the flattening effect that you see, for example, Gilles mentioned work with people like Nick Bloom, for example, I think there's an expansion in terms of market hinterlands, which in a country such as the UK, where we have a lot of towns and cities kind of rubbing up against each other, the gaps between many towns are you know, in, in the hundreds of meters in some cases. I think there is a risk for smaller places which are economically weak. And the kind of thing I'd be thinking about is where I teach at the University of Sheffield. Sheffield's a relatively small city, People living in outer villages, commuting into the city centre and kind of service sector, uh, high value jobs um, on a daily basis, suddenly now are interested in jobs in Manchester or even further afield in London because the, the wage gains potentially are very big. And if you're only commuting twice a week, if you can negotiate exactly as Grant said, then actually that becomes a very attractive proposition. So I think there's a potential hinterland effect, so kind of a spatial resorting of certain types of hinterlands. So, you know, London, my guess is that hinterland will spread even further, but then places which are not caught in the shadow of, of, of you know, Edinburgh, London or whatever may actually end up being somewhat caught. So I think that's one observation. And the third one, on the green transitions, as with many countries in the UK, the weaker regions are more exposed to carbon mitigation processes because they have a higher levels of carbon intensive activities. So kind of navigating that is, is itself going to be very, very challenging. Great, thank you. Well, on to now another kind of transition, well, particularly in the UK, where obviously with Brexit, we are reassessing our migration policy, our trade policy. A question from Carol Proffer is, or Gillette, um, to what extent do you think migration from outside the EU can help European countries with low demographic growth to rejuvenate left behind areas and cities? Okay, so my worry is, is indeed in, in a world where you have fixed or possibly like Germany declining population, and you have some strong tendencies for some cities to, to want to grow, uh, something has to give. Uh, the number of cities has to go down, right? So uh, 
one way this may play out in a world with where people are not that mobile, uh, at least in terms of permanent phone mobility, but maybe becoming a lot more mobile in terms of ability to, to work remotely. Uh, that may be exactly what I think we describe with Phil, where uh, some cities will increase their interland and their suburbs uh, greatly. And indeed, there might be some places in the middle that are going to be hit because they're not part of anything. And again, those big those places that want to be well, that want to grow are going to grow, and with total population staying put, again, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's just an ending up constraint. So something has to give. Uh, I think having some some migration certainly helps in that respect. Thank you. And um, now a question that has been asked in different ways by two people. Um, it's really between kind of what's best for regions and what's best for the country. So Resham Thapa has asked, is spatial inequality bad for the economy? If yes, does policy, is policy correction possible? And another related question is, if cities are growth engines for some countries, then do leveling up type policies kind of, you know, there's the trade off between what's good for the regions and the national economy. So maybe if each of you want to talk about how you think about those trade offs at a time when particularly in the UK and in many countries, we've had anemic growth since the financial crisis. So aggregate growth is also a concern. So a big thing that's often missing from those debates is the fact that, you know, we see those spatial disparities. They are insightful uh, and unesthetic for sure and problematic uh, and so on and so forth. But it's not quite clear what the market failures behind all this really, really are. Again, it may just be if it's only about people on, uh, of different skills choosing to live in different locations. Uh, that's a social policy problem. That's no longer really a spatial. Uh, that's no longer really a spatial problem. That's a spatial manifestation of well of something. So uh, that's certainly an issue. So what I think are the key the key problems here is that. Indeed, for some economic activities, there are some coordination problems. There's an, there's, an, there's an all at one problem. Or if people start thinking, OK, this place is dying, and so on and so forth, that's going to accelerate some movements out and stuff. So uh, some of that uh, may lead to inefficient outcomes, uh, especially if not enough centers are being well populated, and so on and so forth. Then people make their location decisions uh, at the average, right? They think about themselves. They don't think about the marginal effects of what they do on the place that they live and the place they're going to. So there are some inefficiencies here that can cut actually in all sorts of ways. You know, by moving to London, uh, you're leaving a place. So the externalities you were creating over there are less. You're moving to London maybe because you want to free ride on all those externalities, and you're going to and you're going to create well more congestion. So in that case, your move would be inefficient. Uh, so here, I don't think we have a really, really good understanding of all that, unfortunately. I wish I could tell you, yes, and we can, I mean, I can tell you about those, all those effects and I could, uh, we'll talk about that for an hour, but uh, quantifying them, I think is, uh, is, is really, really complicated. So I don't think we, I don't think we know what the answers are, uh, but indeed one of my big worries about um, all those regional policies is that you're moving economic activity from places that are more productive into places that are less productive. Uh, I'm not quite sure, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this is not a great idea. I think we're out of time and we could, I could go on talking about this for a long time. Um, so I'd really like to thank our speaker and our respondents um, and all those who submitted questions. And I'm really sorry for those we didn't manage to get to. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, please look out for the next webinar, which will be early in the new year. Um, a recording of the session will be available in the coming days. So look out for that. I think we'll be sent a link to it. You also should have just seen a post-event attendee survey. Please fill that out if you have time. It would be greatly appreciated. And thank you again all for joining us. And I wish you a good rest of the afternoon or wherever you are in the world morning and, and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.